wonder if I could have your attention. Uh, I know everybody's enjoying a, a very, very excellent chicken marsala. And my kudos to the, the chef for doing a really great job on that. Uh, I'm Ray Remy, uh, and I chair of the Rose Board of Governors for the Rose Institute, and we're delighted to be one of the, be a sponsor for this luncheon. Uh, it also uh, is a luncheon that precedes the uh, regular meeting of the Board of Governors and then our meeting with the members of the Rose staff and the students, so it's a, it's a very special and important day for us. And we're delighted that uh, we could be here as the host for this particular luncheon and talk about uh, a subject that uh, <clears throat> is clear on everybody's mind and hopefully will be in, the, in two weeks. A lot of people kind of throw up their hands about the, the situation politically in, in our country. And they, they wish for the good old constitutional basis back to our founding fathers when we had a much more civil society. On the other hand, uh, George Washington served two terms and at the end of his second term, much to people's surprise, he, he chose not to continue as the president. And part of it was because he was just bitterly disappointed at seeing the partisan divide that had split the country, the founding of the Whigs, the Tories, uh, the fact that on one side he had a Hamilton and he had an Adams, the other side he had a Jefferson and he had a, a Madison, and the party and the country seems to be coming apart in terms of, 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 of bitter controversy. And he couldn't wait soon enough to turn the job over uh, to John Adams. And of course, John Adams, uh, if you had gone and see the play Hamilton, uh, King George said, who's succeeding this royal king, George Washington? And someone said, John Adams. And he said, that pitiful little man. <laughs> so indeed, political discourse way back in the 1700s was there. And, and, and you look back at once again, the good old times of the Constitution, in which you had the Vice President of the United States uh, shoot and kill in a, in, a, in a duel one of the leaders of the other political faction in Alexander Hamilton. We haven't quite sunk to that depth in this cycle, but sometimes I think we're getting close. Abraham Lincoln, a few years later, he had to sneak into Washington for his own safety because there were so many threats on his life and the country was so badly and deeply divided and he did not want to be seen in a public way because of the fear that somebody would be after him and what a presence of the future that indeed was. We look at now in, in a height of, of a lot of people say total incivility. We look at a time in which we are divided as many people said by great tribal separations. We look at a, a situation in which we are greeted each day by pipe bomb threats, and we are indeed in a strange and awful world of Trump. Not saying Trump is awful, but the world around it seems to be resolved that way. We're fortunate to have uh, with us uh, one of the CMC family members that we are most proud of, not only a, an outstanding historian in terms of our American political history, but a person who's called upon from time to time to give his very wise and prescient views of the political scene. And we were very honored when, when uh, Jack uh, Pitney agreed to be the speaker for us at lunch and for all of you to uh, hear what his thoughts are uh, in the world of Trump and what we're going to see at this, uh, this great midterm that's coming. And so I turn it over now to our good friend, Jack Pitney. Okay, now, uh, as uh, some of you know, two years ago, I can tell by the reaction, right? Uh, I uh, stood here very confidently predicted the outcome of the 2016 election. I mean, going state by state, you know, looking at the polling data, the campaign finance data, and predicted that Hillary Clinton was gonna win day before the election. Uh, and uh, last week, an old friend, so a lot of you know, Steve Frades, came to visit me specifically for the purpose of getting my predictions on the 2018 election so he could bet the other way. 
I, I hope I will provide you with useful information in the next half hour or so. Uh, and if you decide to cast bets uh, uh, and, and make money as a result of those bets, uh, I, I think John Ferranda would like to speak to you about uh, scoring some of that money for the college. Uh, midterm elections. Uh, we're fortunate in this department to have uh, a leading expert on midterm elections, Andy Bush. Uh, strongly recommend his book on this subject. Uh, the importance of midterm elections, uh, a uniquely American institution, uh, providing the electorate an opportunity to uh, provide a check and balance, a mid-course correction on a presidential administration. And so in the next few minutes, we'll talk about things that are going on in the uh, 2018 midterm election, some of the issues, uh, some of the likely outcomes. Uh, but first, what's an election panel without campaign ads? Uh, so we're gonna start with uh, th three different kinds of campaign ads. The first, uh, I, I call the O. Henry ad. If you're familiar with American literature, O. Henry uh, was uh, famous for short stories that sometimes had surprising endings. The congressman isn't doing anything to help rural America. Paul's absolutely not working for his district. If they care about health care, they care about their children's health care. They would hold him to account if they care about jobs, they would hold him to account. If he actually cared about people in rural Arizona, I bet he'd be fighting for Social Security, for better access to health care. I, I bet he would be researching what is the most insightful water policy to help the environment of Arizona sustain itself and be successful. And he's not listening to you, and he doesn't have your interests at heart. My name is Tim Gosar. David Gosar. Grace Gosar. Joan Gosar. Gaston Gosar. Jennifer Gosar. Paul Gosar is my brother. My brother. And I endorse Dr. Brill. Dr. Brill wholeheartedly endorse Dr. David Brill for Congress. I'm Dr. David Brill, and I approve this message. That's a commercial with a message. Be nice to your brothers and sisters. You may run for office someday, and you don't want them in an attack ad. Uh, next one is an attack ad with some, some wit attached to it. I thought I was good at hiding. Well, now Nara Paulson comes along. I mean, how can you have tens of thousands of people looking for you all the time and not one of them find you? I started to wonder, did Derek Paulson really exist? I mean, I mean, where's the proof? Some blurry photo taken from miles away? Well, I had to know, so I had to come up with a plan. Paulson takes piles of money from Big Pharma and votes to erode essential health care protections. So, the most likely place to find him is at a big pharmaceutical company. And that's where I went. I was prepared to stay there for weeks. It took seven minutes. I was so shocked when I saw him walking by, I almost dropped the camera, but I got it. Got it. Visual proof. <sighs> so take it from me, Bigfoot. Eric Paulson really exists. Uh, and uh, the point there is, uh, funny yeah, but more serious point, the uh, health care is uh, a major focus of Democrats, particularly you're gonna be hearing a lot about health care from Democrats in the next couple of weeks, uh, which is a very good issue for them, and uh, we can uh, talk about that in the Q&A. Finally, uh, just to uh, get things off on a, uh, on a more elevated note, uh, a more inspiring uh, internet video 
Uh, Democrats have uh, done a very effective job not only at recruiting women candidates, uh, unusually large number of female candidates, but a large number of female candidates who are also veterans of the military or the intelligence services. Before I decided to run for office, before I became a combat search and rescue pilot, I followed my dreams. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Before I served eight years with CIA. Or became a captain in the Air Force. Became a Navy helicopter pilot. Before I was promoted to commander. Before I was a CIA analyst in the Middle East. Before serving three tours. In Iraq. In Afghanistan. Aboard the USS Harry S. Truman. Before I was awarded the Purple Heart. Or becoming a federal agent. I was the first woman Marine to fly in an F-18 in combat. Before I served in the Bush and Obama White House. In the Executive Office of the President. Commanding over 400 combat-ready sailors. In the Marines. The CIA. In the Air Force. Before I announced my candidate to see for Congress. I chose to serve my country. I bled on foreign soil for people to have the right to vote. This is the first time I've run for office. I have never run for political office before. I, I started realizing maybe I should run myself. Like, all right, let's go, let's do this. And come November 6th, I will continue to serve the people. The people of Michigan. Of Pennsylvania. New Jersey. Kentucky. Virginia. The people of Texas. I will continue to serve the people of the United States of America. Are you ready to serve America? Okay, so that's, uh, I, I think, a really, really good ad. Now, whether it really uh, has any impact on the electorate uh, remains to be seen. Very often, the candidate who runs, oops, <laughs> I meant to do that. Very often, the candidate who runs the best ads uh, doesn't get elected. Uh, there was a case several years ago, uh, those of you from Oregon may remember uh, a candidate named Monica Webby. Uh, who uh, was a surgeon, and there was this heartwarming, absolutely, you know, you, I still get verklempt just thinking about it, uh, about her saving the life of a baby, and uh, it's just an amazing ad, but it turns out that if you remember the movie Fatal Attraction, in real life she was actually Glenn Close, uh, and when that came out, that was kind of the end of her chances of getting elected. But the, uh, there are certain aspects of the election that are quantifiable and predictable. One of which is this, and uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about individual races, but one thing is pretty clear. The president's party is likely to lose seats. And if we look historically, uh, Nearly every election uh, since 1934, with uh, a couple of notable exceptions, the President's party has lost seats in the House. Uh, the exceptions, some of you may remember, were 1998 uh, in the middle of the impeachment controversy. Uh, Democrats actually gained seats in the House of Representatives. Uh, and that was a clear reaction to what was uh, a very unpopular effort to impeach President Clinton. Uh, four years later, in 2002, Republicans gained seats uh, in the House. That was in the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, president Bush, we remember now, was a very unpopular president, but it, for about a year and a half after 9-11, his approval ratings were quite high which leads to the next graph here. Uh, unpopular presidents uh, have a tendency to bring their parties down. Uh, as you can see here, uh, George W. Bush uh, was uh, pretty popular at the midterm. Uh, other presidents were not. Uh, Barack Obama, uh, his first midterm, uh, his numbers were way down. And so you can see some definite uh, similarities between that and uh, Donald Trump. This is the uh, real clear politics average. Now you may notice in recent days he's had, had a bit of an uptick. 
Uh, partly that's a result of uh, economic news. But he is still way under, underwater, and very likely on election day, uh, he will continue to be underwater. And that's not where you want to be when your party is heading into a midterm. That's not the uh, only thing going on here, but it's a significant liability for the Republicans. Another liability which is related to the first is retirements. And uh, just uh, you could scroll through the list. You'll notice the list of Republican retirements is considerably longer than the list of Democratic retirements. This is a danger side. This is uh, something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. When politicians reckon that they're uh, going to lose the next election, they may decide that's the best time to get out of Dodge and voluntarily retire, leave with their head high and their uh, campaign treasury full uh, so they can live to fight another day. And when so many people retire, uh, that's a sign that maybe they figure mm, things don't look so good. And in turn, that worsens the prospects for the party in power because as everybody here knows, incumbents are more likely to win re-election than open seat candidates or challengers. So the retirement of incumbents uh, opens a lot of opportunity for the opposite party. So you take Trump's unpopularity, you put it together with a large number of Republican retirements, and you get a situation where the uh, Democrats have a serious chance of taking control of the House of Representatives. Now here's the party breakdown. Currently, uh, 235 uh, Republicans, 193 Democrats. Two, there are a couple of Democratic vacancies that are pretty much certain to uh, remain in the Democratic column, so think 195 instead of 193. Uh, so Democrats need to take 23 Republican seats to get a majority in the House of Representatives. Well, can they do it? Well, uh, pollsters have uh, a question they ask. Uh, the wording varies, but if the election were held today, would you vote for the Republican candidate or the Democratic candidate for Congress in your district? Uh, and uh, 538 uh, tabulates a variety of different polls, but the uh, average central tendency is pretty clear. Democrats have been leading on this for a long time. And if you look at the very latest numbers, uh, 50.1, uh, by average, 50.1% say Democrats, 42% say Republicans. So, uh, if you had a popular vote, absolutely, positively clear Democrats would win. However, we do not have a national popular vote for Congress any more than we have a national popular vote for president. Uh, because if we did have a national popular vote for president, my prediction of two years would in fact have come true. <laughs> uh, and we'd be looking at the first midterm of the Hillary Clinton administration. But we don't and we do not have a direct popular vote for the House of Representatives. And this is uh, absolutely crucial in understanding uh, the significance of the margin and the necessity of looking at seat-by-seat -seat ratings. Uh, given that we have so many Rose Institute people here, uh, what I'm about to say is not going to come as a huge surprise. Uh, there is this phenomenon called gerrymandering. And yes, given that we're here, Rose Institute people, we all know it's pronounced with a hard G. Okay, lots of nodding heads. Yes, he said it right. Uh, and there are uh, several states with pretty egregious uh, Republican gerrymanders. Uh, a lot of, as a lot of you know, the process it consists of cracking and packing. A lot of districts, Democrats, are packed into uh, a small number of seats where there are a lot of wasted votes. But, really important to understand, it's not just gerrymandering. In fact, it's mostly not gerrymandering. Uh, the bigger problem for Democrats nationwide when it comes to any kind of district election is this. Democrats like cities. 
Democrats like jamming together in one place. Uh, take Los Angeles. You could fire a cannon down most streets in Los Angeles and not hit a Republican. Uh, so in Los Angeles, you have elections for the House, you have elections for state legislature. Democrats typically win 70, 80, sometimes 90 percent of the vote. Yay, but that means that vote is not very uh, efficiently distributed. Uh, on the Republican side, the vote is a bit more spread out. You have some heavily Republican districts, but it's not the same as with the Democrats. So. Uh, we get to election eve and you, say, and you see the generic vote. Democrats are ahead by two, three points. They're not going to win. Uh, Republicans are going to win. Uh, so that's why the margin is so significant. Uh, and a lead in the generic vote doesn't necessarily mean that the Democrats are going to win control of the House of Representatives. So, what is likely to happen? Well, Cook Political Report uh, looks seat by seat, and uh, as you can see by the seat by seat ratings, uh, you can see Democrats are actually in a pretty good uh, position. You have a number of Republican toss-up seats, no Democratic toss-up seats. Uh, 13 seats here in, uh, held by Republicans that lean Democratic, four more likely Democratic, uh, only a couple of uh, seats that are likely uh, to swing from Democrat to Republican. Uh, so on a seat by seat basis, and we can, uh, several of these are in California. Uh, you can see Comrade Rohrabacher uh, is, uh, is listed as a toss up. Uh, Mimi Walters is listed as a toss-up. Actually, I, I might nudge that over into the, uh, into the lean Democratic category. Uh, and there's some recent uh, poll numbers to back that up. Uh, so on a seat-by-seat -seat basis, it seems to confirm what uh, the generic vote would suggest, and this is that the Democrats are going to win control of the House. And we'll talk about some of the possible consequences of that in just a second. Uh, political scientists have various uh, formulas for uh, predicting the uh, vote in the House of Representatives. And uh, they use variables such as generic ballot, economic uh, data, uh, number of seats that are exposed, uh, that is the party having a majority obviously has more ground to defend uh, and is at greater risk of losing ground. Uh, these are all very distinguished and uh, well-established political science, particularly Alan Abramowitz probably has the most accurate predictions. Uh, and he's saying uh, that uh, the Reaps are going to lose uh, 30 seats in the House. Uh, others have the figure, uh, this one has a little lower, a couple of uh, forecasting formulas have it higher, but it's all pointing in the same direction. Uh, very likely, as of today, the Democrats are going to win control of the House of Representatives. And mind you, uh, these are all, uh, as you can see, uh, predictions that were made a long time ago. And uh, that's what they were trying to do. They were arguing that uh, elections for the House of Representatives are decided by the fundamentals, and the fundamentals very strongly uh, favored the Democrats. So, uh, but wait, there's more. Uh, as the video with the women candidates uh, suggests, Democrats have done a pretty good job of candidate recruitment, very strong candidates uh, all across the country, and they've done a terrific job of fundraising. As you can see here, uh, here in California, for instance, nearly uh, every Republican running for the House in California is being outspent by Democrats. Democrats are making money like crazy, and a lot of it is coming in, in small amounts. 
uh, which is a great sign for Democrats because if you get somebody giving you a, a small contribution as well below the federal cap, you can hit that person up again. It's literally the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, now, you may also see that uh, Republicans have access to a large amount of super PAC money thanks to Citizens United. Uh, however, if you're a Republican, don't count on this coming to the rescue. Number one, uh, super PAC money buys ads. Ads do not determine election. Number two, sounds like a technical point, but awfully important. When it comes to buying television time for ads, the law says that television stations have to give candidates a discounted rate. Super PACs do not get the discounted rate. Uh, so that money is, uh, has a lot less firepower. You get a lot more bang for the buck with the direct candidate spending. Uh, so that's an advantage for the Democrats. So financially, they're doing great. Uh, the uh, formulas tend to favor the Democrats, generic vote. In a couple of minutes, I'll offer a couple of words of caution. Senate is... Uh, is tougher for the Democrats, also tougher to predict. You really can't develop a national formula for Senate races because uh, in any given year you only have uh, uh, 33, give or take a couple. And uh, just kind of hard to develop a formula for that. You're also dealing with constituencies of vastly different size and races in which candidate characteristics matter far more than they do in House elections. Uh, this is a tough election for the Democrats because uh, the peculiar cycle of Senate elections means that the composition of the class depends on the outcome of whatever happened six years ago, six year term in the Senate. Six years ago, Barack Obama was uh, being reelected and the Democrats had a really good night in Senate races, which means most of the seats up in 2018 are already held by the Democrats which means there are opportunities for increases, opportunities for seat turnovers are very limited. Very, very, very hard for Democrats to make net gains in uh, Senate elections, if only because the uh, uh, so few Republican seats are up for election this time. And most of those seats are not terribly uh, competitive. If you scroll down and look at solid R, you've got uh, Nebraska, Utah, uh, Wyoming. These are not seats that Democrats have a whole lot of hope in. Uh, and to add to Democratic woes, there's at least one seat that uh, they're probably going to lose, uh, Heidi Heitkamp in uh, North Dakota. She was having uh, a tough race already. North Dakota, strongly Republican state, uh, very energy dependent, uh, where Trump's policies on shale, on fracking are extremely popular, uh, running against a congressman who also represents the state, somebody with a statewide name ID. Very, very tough. Uh, she came out, voted against Kavanaugh. North Dakota is one state where that's not a popular position. So, uh, if I had to bet the rent, it uh, looks like Heidi Heitkamp is going to lose. So that means to get a majority, Democrats need three seats, not just two. Remember, uh, what, they have 49 seats, but one won't do it because in the Senate, the vice president breaks the tie. So they've got to they gotta have a, uh, they got to get up to 51 seats. Uh, and with Heitkamp gone, they've got to pick three. Hmm. It's a, tough, uh, it's a tough map. Nelson in Florida, that's a close race. He's ahead slightly, but uh, uh, he's running against the incumbent governor seeking a Senate seat who's also really rich. So that's a tough position for him to be in, in a state won by Donald Trump. Uh, Donnelly uh, in Indiana, uh, Indiana's a Republican state, kind of tough for him to hold on to that. He kind of won it by a fluke last time running against a historically bad uh, Republican opponent. Uh, he's ahead, I don't know. Uh, Missouri, uh, Claire McCaskill, 
another tough race. This is another Trump state. Uh, she, she's running even, but uh, I wouldn't be utterly shocked, uh, metaphysically challenged, if she lost that election. Uh, Tester in Montana, uh, home state of the next president of the United States, but I digress. <laughs> little, little pride in my thesis advisee there, uh, Governor Steve Bullock. Uh, he's ahead slightly, but let's face it, it's Montana. Uh, tough state for a Democrat to win in. Uh, not inconceivable, even in the lean D seats, uh, Bob Menendez, New Jersey. New Jersey, uh, uh, which is a Democratic state, he's a long-serving incumbent. Uh, but also he faced federal charges on corruption and ended in a hung jury. Uh, and, uh, you know, if people are concerned about political corruption, eh, you know, Menendez is not necessarily a good spokesperson for the party. Uh, so uh, it's a tough one. There are some potentials for, uh, for Democratic pickups. Uh, if you go, look down here, Arizona, Kristen Sinema uh, is in a very competitive race against Martha McSally. She could win. Uh, Dean Heller, a uh, very tight race, Nevada, state that Hillary Clinton uh, ran in. Uh, Tennessee, Democrats uh, scored a great recruiting victory, uh, uh, recruiting Phil Bredesen, former governor. Uh, and then we have a CMC interest in the Texas race here, uh, who I think of as Heidi's husband. Uh, uh, Heidi's husband is in a tough race. If it were Heidi running, it, would, nah, it wouldn't even be competitive. If Heidi were, this, unfortunately for Texas and America, uh, uh, Heidi is not the senator, Ted is. And uh, uh, it's Ted Cruz, all right? So, I mean, you lose 10 points just for being Ted Cruz. Uh, running against Beto O'Rourke, who uh, is doing a fantastic job of fundraising. I think Cruz is gonna win in the end because it, it's Texas, uh, but, uh, uh, we'll see what happens there. So uh, it's a tough one for the Democrats to take the Senate, even if they do well in the House. So let's uh, start to wrap up uh, and look at various scenarios. After 2016, I vowed I would never be trapped into the situation again of offering a single prediction. <laughs> so in lieu of a single prediction, I will give three different scenarios. Scenario one, the most likely one, that if I were doing the single prediction, which I'm not, uh, it would be this. Uh, House pick, uh, Democrats pick up anywhere from 25 to 35 seats and with that control of the House of Representatives, uh, no net change in the Senate. Uh, my, my hunch is uh, we're at uh, 51.49 now, that will be 51.49 after. Uh, Heidi Heitkamp uh, is going to lose, but Democrats uh, will probably pick up one seat to offset that, but no net change. I think that's the most likely outcome as of today. Now, what does this mean? Uh, investigations. Democrats take control of the House. They're not going to be able to pass any legislation uh, that gets into law because the uh, Republicans uh, will control the Senate and Trump will remain as president. Uh, but the one thing they can do is uh, run lots and lots of investigations and expect them to focus on that a lot. And here is a fun fact straight out of U.S. code, uh, which is one reason why Trump is crisscrossing the country and working so hard right now. Under U.S. code, the chair of the Ways and Means Committee has the right to request to see and the Secretary of the Treasury is obligated to provide the tax return of any taxpayer. So Democrats take a majority in the House. U.S. Code says they can get Trump's tax returns. Now he's gonna fight that in court. We'll see how that plays out, but uh, I'm sure that's very much on his mind these days. Scenario two. It could be a good Republican night. Remember what I was saying before. Uh, look at the generic vote, looks really good for the Democrats, but if that narrows a little, 
that's where the geography kicks in. Uh, again, the Democratic vote is highly concentrated. The Republican vote is more uh, efficiently distributed. It would not be inconceivable that, Demo that Republicans could eke out uh, a narrow majority. They could end up with you know, being two or three seats ahead of the Democrats. Uh, that's not much uh, statistically, but substantively it makes all the difference in the world. If they have a two or three seat majority, it means they get all the committee chairmanships, no investigations, no ways and means asking for Trump's tax return. Not likely, I don't think that's the likely outcome, but it could happen, it could happen. Uh, and I would not be at all shocked if uh, the Republicans actually gain in the Senate, just given the structure of the seats, given uh, the imbalance of what kinds of seats are up. Uh, scenario three, great Democratic night. Uh, Democrats pick up 40 plus House seats and uh, they narrowly win control of the Senate. Uh, that could also happen. How could this happen? Well, we're looking at the generic vote. A uh, generic vote looks at likely voters. Well, who's a likely voter uh, based on uh, past voting performance? Well, Democrats are working really, really, really hard to turn out low propensity voters. Uh, if this effort succeeds, and it could, that means that uh, the polls measuring generic vote intention and uh, results in individual races are greatly understating the size of the Democratic electorate. One state where this could come into play, again, a yet another CMC connection, state of Georgia. Uh, I know some of you are following the uh, Georgia governor's race. Uh, Stacey Abrams, African-American woman, be the first African-American woman uh, governor of Georgia, uh, running against a guy named Brian Kemp, uh, who's also the secretary of state in charge of the voting procedures. Uh, that's led to some controversy. Uh, but uh, they're counting on uh, an unusually heavy African-American turnout, usually heavy youth turnout, people inspired by Stacey Abrams, and Stacey Abrams' uh, superb press secretary, Caitlin Hyland, uh, CMC alum. A recent CMC alum, mind you, not, not somebody from the class of, uh, of 60. This is, uh, uh, Caitlin is class of 14. Uh, yeah, uh, so you too can be press secretary for a major gubernatorial candidate in just a few years. Uh, so that's a race to watch. Polls show that could be close, and if the polls are understating Democratic turnout, even by a little, Stacey Abrams could win. Uh, there's some other governor's races. Um, Florida's getting a lot of attention. Andrew Gillum, uh, a, a, another African-American candidate, uh, is actually ahead in, uh, in Georgia, I'm sorry, in Florida, so he could win. Uh, and finally, here in California, I know this is going to come as a shock to everyone. Shock number one, Democrats are going to maintain the U.S. Senate seat in California. Why, <laughs> why is this not a shock? Because it is impossible for them not to. There are only two candidates on the ballot, both Democrats, Dianne Feinstein, Kevin DeLeon. Uh, as a result of our top two primary system. Uh, latest poll from Public Policy Institute of California uh, suggests that uh, Feinstein has a double digit lead. She wins. Um, Kevin DeLeon, he'll live to fight another day. We could see him running for something else in the future, but he's not going to be a United States Senator uh, this time out. Uh, not a whole lot of uh, uh, not, not a whole lot of suspense in the gubernatorial race either. Shows uh, Gavin Newsom with a double digit lead over John Cox. I suspect that when all is said and done, uh, Gavin Newsom is gonna win by a much bigger margin. I suspect it's gonna be in the vicinity of 60-40. Why do I say 60-40? Uh, eight years ago, uh, Meg Whitman spent historic sums, over $100 million out of her own pocket, mind you, on her gubernatorial race against Jerry Brown, 41% of the vote. Four years ago, Neil Kashkari spends about $1.98. I exaggerate slightly. 
uh, but not much. Um, he said, you know, uh, Neil Kashkari could have self-financed a run for state assembly, uh, but his, he just was not rich enough to, uh, uh, to run in the state of California. He gets 40% of the vote. That's basically what a Republican gubernatorial candidate is gonna get in California. Uh, Cox has not been able to raise a lot of money, not been able to do most of the things that a uh, candidate needs to do. His one debate with Gavin Newsom was on public radio on a Monday morning. Uh, that was not exactly what you would call a breakout moment. Uh, so uh, 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 if uh, he should win, that would be a, an upset of historic, uh, if Cox should win, that would be an upset of historic proportions. Uh, so that's what's likely to happen, and I think we have some time left for questions. Great, thank you, Professor Pitney, for your talk. Um, we'll now open it up to questions. As always, students get priority. Thank you, Professor Pitney, for coming out and uh, speaking with us. I recently heard about a Spanish caravan coming up through uh, Central America coming to our border, and according to the New York Times, the Republicans cannot stop talking about it, and the Democrats would uh, rather it not even be mentioned. Do you think that will have any play in the midterm elections? It might have an impact in some districts. Uh, there are certain Republican districts where there is uh, extraordinary concern about immigration. It might have some impact there. Uh, in the past couple of days, the pipe bomb story has knocked that off cable news. Uh, and also, if you do the arithmetic, it's highly unlikely that the caravan's gonna get anywhere near the border uh, in time for election day. Uh, you're gonna continue to see pictures, but uh, highly, highly unlikely, unless these are uh, Olympic League marathoners every day, uh, that they will, uh, they will get close. So some impact in some districts, but nationwide, it's not gonna change the overall picture. Uh, thanks, Professor Whitney. Um, so you mentioned briefly how uh, Democrats would, could have a great night if there's above average voter turnout among low propensity voters. I was wondering if you could expand upon um, what are the arguments for or against and where do you fall on the question of whether Democrats' animus against President Trump will likely lead to greater voter turnout? Okay, argument four is just talk to any Democrats. Uh, one group that has tended not to turn out in high numbers is young people. Uh, well, guess what? Young people don't like Trump. Uh, some of you have seen me in class. I've uh, got, uh, there's a map of pre every precinct in the United States and how it voted in this election. This precinct, Gary Johnson got more votes than, than Donald Trump. Uh, it was something like, you know, 90% for Hillary Clinton and they, uh, Johnson and Trump split the rest. Uh, is this, uh, so, uh, one way this could benefit the Democrats if there's an extraordinary, unusually high turnout among young people. However, one problem uh, for young people is registration. Uh, you have to be registered to vote. A lot of young people aren't registered. Here in California, uh, we now have same-day registration. Uh, that might help the Democrats in some of the close races in California. So that's something that could go either way. I don't know. I just don't know how young people are going to vote. I suspect it'll, it could be higher than, than usual, but at this point, we don't know. Uh, Latinos. Uh, uh, Trump, uh, for obvious reasons, isn't particularly uh, popular among Latino voters. Guess what? In two, two years ago, we did not have especially high turnout among Latinos just didn't happen. Uh, if I were, uh, a lot of you know Clark Lee, uh, my old student who's helping run the Democrats in California, I'm sure this is one of his big frustrations trying to generate higher Latino turnout because a lot of, politically, a lot of low hanging fruit there for the Democrats. Uh, if they can gin up Latino turnout, that's gonna be big in uh, California, Texas, New Mexico, Florida. Uh, we'll see how that happens. African-American turnout, I suspect that is going to be higher. 
Uh, polls indicate that you've got, uh, again, a couple of state races, Georgia, Florida, some others. Uh, we have very, very strong African-American candidates. That could make a difference. Uh, but again, you just are not going to know until Election Day. Uh, so my guess is Democrats are probably going to have good turnout, but we'll see. Professor Pitney, over here on the left. Yeah. So right. uh, in some of the <clears throat> uh, survey data on the uh, De Leon-Feinstein race, um, it's, I think the, one of the groups where De Leon is actually winning is with Republicans, Yeah. which boggles my mind given that he's far more left than Dianne Feinstein, right? So a pragmatic Republican would vote for Dianne Feinstein as the lesser of two evils. So uh, this is probably not the only scenario, although one of the few where we have two at the top, I would assume, although you know better than I. What does this kind of tell you from your perspective on the state of affairs with voter knowledge and understanding of the candidates, disinterest in that? Are you surprised by those numbers when you see him on that uh, PPIC survey and the fact that Republicans? Not really surprised uh, as I've discussed in class, never overestimate what voters know. The one thing that voters know about Kevin DeLeon is that he isn't Dianne Feinstein. After all these years, Dianne Feinstein is sort of semi-familiar to a lot of voters, uh, but uh, probably most voters really couldn't tell you very much about her other than that she's some Democrat politician out there somewhere, and DeLeon isn't her. So they're voting for him even though, he, you're right, he's uh, considerably more progressive than she is, but they don't know that. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the uh, lack of voter information is gonna be a significant factor, particularly in some of the uh, ballot measure uh, races as well. Uh, so I think that's what's going on there. Hi, Professor, thanks Hi, for your Brent. talk. How much of an impact do you think that the presence of the gas tax repeal proposition is going to have on voter turnout in California races? Uh, I prepared for this question by giving that as a paper assignment in my interest groups class. So let me plagiarize what my students have told me. Uh, Republicans put that on the ballot in hopes that it would generate a humongous uh, voter turnout. Republicans, yeah, you know, this is just going to be like Prop 13. We're going to turn out in huge numbers. Uh, polls didn't show that it had that effect, and uh, the Republicans have basically uh, abandoned it because they have a lot of their incumbents who are in trouble, and if you're a Republican, you're going to put your money into those races rather than through this too clever by half uh, indirect approach of putting a measure on the ballot trying to gin up turnout. Uh, if you've seen an ad on Prop 6, very likely it's no on 6. Uh, the uh, no side is greatly outspending the yes side. And what are the no uh, ads saying? They're not talking about what Prop 6 actually does. They're not saying, vote against uh, the measure that would repeal the gas tax increase. Uh, vote for lower taxes. They're not saying that. Uh, they're talking about the impact on, uh, on roads, on uh, public safety, on response times. Uh, and that's the message that's getting across. So looks like that's going down. It's not going to gin, out, gin up Republican turnout at all. Uh, and, it's, uh, and I'd be very shocked if it actually even passed. Hmm. Gee, I didn't plant this with you, did I? <laughs> Gee, is there a Democrat that I can think of who represents the negation of Donald Trump? Somebody with a superb undergraduate education. <laughs> Somebody who wrote a terrific senior thesis on welfare reform in Montana. Uh, somebody with a genuine record of working across the aisle, uh, focusing on practical problem solving, being able to build cross-party coalitions, and yet at the same time appealing to progressive Democrats 
through longtime advocacy of campaign finance reform. Uh, and specifically, uh, a long-standing fight against dark money in elections. Somebody uh, who is intelligent, somebody who is well-versed and comes across uh, as somebody who's for something rather than just against something. I am, of course, talking about the next president of the United States, Steve Bullock of the class of 1988. Here's the thing. Okay, I, I'm a little prejudiced uh, in favor of my former student, uh, but even if uh, I had never even met Steve Bullock, I would still put him on the list. Here's why. Uh, two years ago, a huge liability for the Democrats was rural America. Trump cleaned up in rural America. Uh, Clinton did fine in the cities, but going back to the Electoral College, uh, that doesn't help the Democrats too much. They need to extend their appeal across and get into more rural areas. Of the 10 most rural states in the union, the only one that elected a Democratic governor, Montana. Not only that, not only that, Steve won re-election in 2016 in the middle of the Trump landslide. So a guy is able to win as a practical, problem-solving Democrat in the middle of a Trump landslide, in the middle of a Trump state, that's somebody who's got something on the ball. Uh, so even if, I, even if I didn't know Steve at all, but again, I'm totally prejudiced here, but uh, even if I didn't, I would say he would be a very smart candidate for the Democrats to run in 2020. Great, so with that, I believe we've exhausted our time for questions. Uh, please thank me again, or please help me thanking <laughs> Professor Pitney.